In this video, we'll be exploring making some changes to our database and how making those changes in the database will reflect in our EDMX diagram. So in today's activity, we're going to be adding some more fields to our vehicles table. Right now, we only have an ID and we have a name. So we know that ID is a primary key and that's auto incrementing is just keeping track of all the records and we have a name but in reality if we're storing vehicle information we need more than just a name other things that we would probably be storing would be like the year the make the model so that would actually split name in two into make and model make being the brand and then the model being you know the the type of vehicle of that brand so for instance we'd have honda civic right honda being the make and civic being the model uh maybe we have a vin a license plates number etc so maybe you have more or fewer things that you'd want to store in your database but today we'll be modifying our database to accommodate those additional fields so going over to our SQL management studio, I just went to the database, found the appropriate table, right clicked and said design. And then we are here in the design view where I can add or remove columns as I see fit. So I did say that I'm going to be adding some. I'm going to say, well, I'm not going to replace name with year. What I'm going to do is replace year. I'm um, sorry, name with make. Right. And then I'm going to add model and it's also going to be envirchar 50. So I'm just going to copy this because it will uh, repeat itself. We'll have the VIN that's like vehicle identification number. That's one of those government things. We have the license plate number. So license plate number which is also varchar 50. So even though it says number, we're not doing any math with it. And my my general philosophy when it comes to database and numbers would be that if I'm not doing math with it, I don't need to store it as a numeric data type, right? And then that would actually facilitate if maybe I start off storing just numbers and then it becomes alphanumeric after a while, then it would have already not been a numeric data type. And then the final one would be the year, which I can just set that one to be... I'll just set that one to be integer. All right. So integer because you're 2020 or 2018, etc. That would be kind of a number. So I'll use that one to be an integer. So after making those adjustments to the database and you notice I have some inconsistencies. So while they're not a big deal, I like to keep my, um, you know, my naming conventions kind of consistent. If I'm using caps, I'm using caps. If I'm not using caps, then I'm not using caps. So just to normalize everything, I'm uh, just going to make everything start with a capital letter and then I'm going to save. And then this is going to trigger an update to the table. So in the database, my data table now has new fields. And if I go and select the top 1000, then you're going to see all of the rows appearing with all of the vehicles that we had to date, all of them appearing with the make, the model, and the additional fields that I added. So here in the make, what was name is now the brand, right? So there are a few that maybe will need some refinement because there is no brand name Buggy, really and truly. Buggy is just something that we call the Volkswagen Beetle back here in Jamaica, but then that says Buggy. So we can update that later. That's part of the task at hand but ultimately you see that our database structure has been updated and successfully so however when i go back over to my application you're going to notice that the table itself even if i refresh i think there's a refresh here well there is not so even if i was to refresh this would not update so i actually have to go through some process to get this data model updated. So we're going to start off by right clicking in the empty space. We have the EDMX document or diagram open once again. We right click in the empty space and then I'm going to say update model from database. When I click that, we get back a similar menu to what we would have gotten when we're creating the data. And then I can go over to refresh, click on tables and click finish. Once I do that, then you're going to see some updates. But then sometimes this doesn't quite work out exactly how we envisioned it, because if you notice, it retained the original ID and name and took on the additional fields. And then it took on an additional 
property which we don't necessarily want. So sometimes it's actually easier having updated the database to actually just select all the tables or all the entities in the model and remove them. So I just highlighted them and I press delete and then it will ask me, are you sure you want to delete? I can say yes, because at the end of the day, that is of very little consequence to the database itself. Of course, if I build right now, I'm going to get some errors because anything that was referencing those models is now going to throw an error because they no longer exist. All right, so here I just did a build and I'm seeing a bunch of errors because I'm making reference to classes that no longer exist. So I'm going to right click again and then I can say update model from database once more. And this time I would use the add. So because I just deleted all the tables, now the, the engine is realizing that, okay, there are tables in the database that I don't have in the model. And that would be my two tables anyway. So I can just click tables, just like we did when we were creating the diagram, click finish, and it will import the new tables with their new columns. And there, that looks a bit better. So we're getting back our two tables and we're getting back types of car with all of the fields from the original set or rather from the modifications that we made. Now, having done that, we actually have to go back and refactor some of our code because we would be making reference to columns that don't exist. So if I go over to my manage vehicle listing.cs form, and I look, I'm seeing that here when we did our special select, we are referencing q.id with a common i and q.name. These two no longer exist actually. No, we are actually selecting q.id with a capital I. So there we go, q.id with a capital I. So the case does matter. However, you set up the columns in SQL or in the database itself, Right, so remember that when we were designing it, I went and changed the common IID to capital IID. I changed the name from, uh, well, I changed the column name to make. So those little things do matter. So because I wrote code to facilitate the common IID and then to facilitate a, a column called name, I have to go back and make those changes. So I don't want name, but this time I want make, right? In this situation though, there are more columns that I want to display because this code was populating my grid view. So I don't want to just see ID and make. As a matter of fact, I really probably don't want to see ID at all. So this time I can actually modify this. So I'm just going to comment out this existing code and I'm going to rewrite this. So I'm going to say var cars is equal to my DB object dot the table that I'm interested in, types of cars. And then I'll just break line right here and say dot select. And then I'm selecting, well, I need my lambda expression first. So I'm using Q again, and then my arrow. And then the columns that I'm interested in this time are Q dot make comma Q dot model. Well, sorry, I actually need to specify uh, the new object, my bad. So I started listing all the columns, that was the wrong path. What I need to say is I want a new object, open curly brace, and then I start listing out each one with its name. So I would say make is equal to, and then I say q dot make, comma, model is equal to q dot model the vin is equal to q dot vin right so remember that when we're making our new model i can determine what i want to be the name of the property but then i'm mapping it uh, this is my name that i'm giving it and i'm just making it be equal to or mapping it to a value coming in from what is being selected from our table, right? So I'm just filling out this model. So once again, make model vin comma, and what else do we have? We have the year is equal to Q dot, and that would be Q dot year. And then finally we have the license plate 
number is equal to Q dot license plate number. All right. And then I'd, I'm going, just going to break line at license plate number because it's going off screen. That's the only reason I'm doing that. So if you don't want to do that, that's fine. And then I'm going to end with my semicolon. So there is a Visual Studio actually formatted it for me because they realized that, okay, you are going off screen. You have a lot. So I'm just putting it back the way Visual Studio wants it. And then at the end of that select, I'm going to say dot to list because I like working with the list data type. All right. So let's review this one more time. We're selecting from our table types of cars and I'm selecting a new object. So we have our Lambda expression and I'm selecting into a new object that has fields make, model, VIN, year, and license plate number. And for each of these fields, I'm just making sure that I map back the appropriate value coming in from our database, right? And then after selecting all of them, I'm just converting that into a list. So when I actually run this, and I'm just going to comment on these two lines, remember that we did these two lines because we wanted the column names to kind of look human readable. But look at what's going to happen. So I'm going to comment these two out, right? So I'm not renaming any columns. So after selecting cars into this variable, I'm then setting that variable as the data source for my grid view. And then I click start, go to my manage vehicle listing. And then you're going to notice that the grid is actually generating with all of the columns coming from my model. So make has its own column, model has its own column, VIN has its own column. Of course, they were all empty in the database, so they're all empty in the grid view. But the point is I used a custom model to generate the columns for the grid view. So at this point, we can actually go back and augment our design of our vehicle listing. Now that we see that we have a grid view that probably needs a bit more space, you probably don't want your users to be scrolling from left to right to see all of the details on the car. So we can rearrange the design so that the grid view has a bit more space. So let me just exit this, go back to our design view, and then what I'm going to do is expand this table, well, expand this, this window a bit more, move the buttons to underneath the grid view. And then I'm going to expand the grid view and make it a bit wider, all right? So now that it's wider, let's see how that looks. All right, so that's what my own looks like. It now fills out that entire grid. And of course, the more rows that appear, the more cards you have is the more that this will expand horizontally. Well, vertically, sorry. Now, just to revisit our add rental record window, another modification that you may want to make is to the drop down list for type of car. So you can see that it has kind of reverted to that um, well, weird looking series of, of items that we saw when we we're just trying to populate it. So we can just go back and revisit that code where we were actually binding. So I'll just go to add rental record, click, right click and go to view code. And then I find the form load function where we were populating it. So we were actually populating all of the types of cards, but we're binding the display member to be name and then binding the value member to be ID. So one, I want to change this to capital I ID and then the value member can be name, but then what I'll do is modify the query that was being used to fill the, con the combo box initially. So what I'm going to do is comment out this query that is being used and I'll just retype it. So I keep on commenting them all because I want us to see where we're coming from and where we're going, right? So I'm going to say var cars is equal to and my entity object inside of add rental record, which is formally form one, is car rental entity. So that's another reason I said earlier, keep it consistent because you don't want to have to guess which name you used in which form. If you use one name across all forms, then you just know that this is the object name that you're using, right? So in this one, we use car rental entities as our object name. So our object dot 
types of cars. And then I'm going to do a similar thing where I'm going to say dot select. And then I'm going to do my Lambda expression. And then I'm going to create a new object, a new abstract object. And this new object, I really need ID to be equal to Q dot ID, right? So I do need ID still for my value member and I do need name. So I'm going to create another field called name that is going to map back to name, which I'm already expecting. But then for name, I'm going to expand it a bit. I'm going to say Q dot make, and then I'm going to concatenate an empty string onto Q onto Q dot make and then add on Q dot model. So in other words, when we retrieve um, the records from the database after this query, we're getting back the ID and then we're getting back some field called name, which is going to have a value of the make and an empty string and the model. So if it's a Honda Civic, then we expect to see Honda Civic appear in our drop down list, right? So after doing that, and I execute, and then I load the add rental record window, then I'm going to get an error. And this error, I'm going to spare you the details of the error, and I'm just going to let you know that it's because we missed the dot to list. So I always say that I like working with lists. Lists are very flexible and they rarely cause problems. So I'm actually going to just put in the dot to list that I missed earlier. And then I'm going to start again. And then you're going to see that it runs this time. And there we go. So it loads properly this time. And you can see in our drop down, we do have our what we had as name, it's showing again, but we don't have anything as model in our database. So just to prove that it's going to show Honda space, whatever it is I put as model, I'm going to go back and I'm going to modify the record. So I'm just going to go to our table, right click, say edit top 200, just going to do it quick and dirty for now. So I'm going to say Honda Civic. So we have a Honda Civic for rental, all right? And I'm just going to make sure it gets committed. And then I'm going to execute again and we see what happens. All right. So now in our drop down list, we see the name appearing, but it's really the make space, the model. So the others don't have a model. So all they're seeing is the make. All right. So that's how you can go about customizing the user experience. Because if a user looks at this, they really don't know what went into getting Honda and Civic to appear in one line. They're just seeing Honda Civic as far as they're concerned, right? And then in our vehicle listing, when I revisit that page, I'm seeing that we have Honda Civic, but blank, 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 because we didn't put in any data for the rest of those, all right? So in our next video, we're going to look at implementing some addition and editing or adding and editing functionality for our records in our car rental records vehicle listing feature.